next presentation is from America as well. Uh, he's uh, the Dr. Tom Gillespie. He's a um, uh, graduate from Purdue University. He's owner and founder of Rensselaer Swine Services in Indiana, United States. He does consulting work in the Midwest and Southeast US and also in, in other countries. He was recognized as the practitioner of the year by the American Association of Swine Veterinarians and also he um, got the um, award from Lehman Conference on practice in science. As you notice, we have two of the best practitioners from America talking to us, which is not, it's not uh, something that we have every day. So I will encourage you to take advantage of this and clarify and shoot uh, good questions to them. With that, uh, Tom. Thank you very much, Jose, for that very kind introduction. I want to thank everybody from BI for this opportunity, but especially our colleagues here in China and the producers that are asking the very good questions about, uh, we got to get my presentation up here, don't we? Here we go. About how do we control pathogens? And as Jose does that, let me see if I can do this. Dr. Lola made my talk very difficult because he's laid out a lot of the basic concepts of an ARC type of project. What's that for? I don't know that he had to give me a pedestal to stand on here, but. But in any case, what we've got, my example of an ARC project is going to be different than what Dr. Lola has just laid out. And I want to take some of the science that the speakers this morning gave us, but I want to start with a little bit of history. What brought America to the point that we're at today? with our attitude towards PERS. Well, for myself, it started back in 1986 when a very important client asked me to eliminate a Jeske's disease in his flow. Now, he asked the question because he realized it was a major pathogen. It was causing him economic harm. So that was his motivation. Well, I started down a path that changed how I looked at practice from this very one question. Now, the reason I find that this is significant for this talk is because I see in my trips over here to China, to other parts of Southeast Asia, I see the same starting point. You're approaching this from where we were at. And hopefully you learn from our mistakes and you can get, get there faster. You're rapidly consolidating this industry. You're changing genetics. You're selecting sows that can provide more pigs. You're learning how to manage those kind of situations. You're also building structures here that's going to allow you to do that. But in some cases, it's also you're building in some limitations. But the driving force is because you understand better health is going to allow you to produce more pigs. They grow faster because they eat. That's the driving force for all of us. So back a few years ago, we called it mystery swine disease. I sat there and I had flashbacks when we were talking about the high path PERS back in 2006 for you guys, because we experienced the same thing. But remember, the virus has changed since the 87, when it first broke out in North America to where it is today, it's more severe. And what we saw then was just the tip of the iceberg 
of what we're seeing today when we have some very devastating production losses that was outlined. Well, let's fast forward to today. We've had great speakers. We've got a lot of good science behind our belts right now, but maybe our minds are spinning a little bit because of all this, and we're trying to fit these pieces of this puzzle together. And I hope I can do that. So how do we take a practical approach? Tim said that we're kind of the part of the speaking sessions here that's going to help apply some of these tools. And this morning, Dr. Yang, Professor Yang, mentioned the word biosecurity. And I'm going to focus on that, but I'm also going to use uh, an ARC project in our practice that uh, is focused a little differently than what Dr. Lola indicated. Biosecurity means a little something different to each of us. You know, we know as we walk through these airports, they've got monitors that try to pick out people with fevers. Well, that's part of biosecurity. We're supposed to wash our hands, you know, all the time so that we don't spread germs. But when I get over to this part of the world, I see vaccination programs like the ones illustrated here. We're injecting pigs every couple of weeks. We're injecting sows with how many different vaccines? So we try to prioritize. We try to pick the ones that are causing us the most problems at that time. But are we building a program? I'm going to step back just a minute and make, another, make the comment just again. This is a concept. ARC is a concept that takes a little while to build that foundation. Dr. Lola says it takes a year and a half in some of these projects, and he's absolutely right. The one in our area started long before I ever knew anything about an ARC project. Because of what we were doing in individual herds, suddenly I said, why not do it in a geographic area? So this whole concept that Dr. Lola said, let's vaccinate everything in this geographic area, that's one concept. But not all the ARC projects are approaching it the same way. The thing that's going to change is combination vaccines. And so we'll be injecting these pigs a few less times, but then we have to learn how to apply that tool. Because is that the right time for each of the pathogens that you're vaccinating for? For instance, BI brought us three flex. That's PERS, circle virus, mycoplasma. Phenomenal tool if it's applied correctly. And so we're learning how to do that. And we've only had the vaccine a, a little while. So this pincushion that I see happening, there are some that feel that every time we vaccinate a pig, we're losing a half a kilo in growth. If we don't use the right product, that was mentioned earlier today, we actually make the animals sick, they're not going to eat, they're not going to grow. That's all part of the learning process on each of your farms, because each farm is unique. And so we're back to looking at what is short-term goals, what's long-term goals. And one of the limitations that I think we still have here in this part of the world is our diagnostics. We are basing a lot of our decisions on PCR. PCR looks for the antigen. The ELISA test looks for the antibody from exposure. Two very different things, but both of them come together for the knowledge that we need to make the right program. Biosecurity, internal versus external. Tim's already outlined this a little bit. External is basically what's outside of your compound where your pigs are housed. Internal, he did a nice job of illustrating that. We're going to go over some of those. What I see here is that we do a pretty good job coming up to the entry gate. But I was talking to a, a breeding unit on my recent uh, visits, and I was asking him about the type of trucks. Did he take the animals from his farm to the receiving farm? And he said no. He said, the receiving farm brings the truck to me. 
And so I asked the very next question, is the truck always clean? And he laughs and he says, no. That's a hurdle that I see in this part of the, of the world that we have to understand is that we move pathogens around on vehicles. Anything that touches that pig. The very first thing, of course, is the animal. The animal moves the pathogens mostly. After that, it's fomites. Isolation units. Are we correctly utilizing isolation units in this part of the world? You know, we have single site units as well that raise their own guilt. But we take the animals out of that finishing unit, put them in an isolation barn where we can vaccinate them, let them cool down before we put them into the sow unit. That's part of the internal biosecurity as another example because what's going on in the finishing animal is different than what's going on in the, in the sow. Unless you're having a massive infection that's going through all the animals on the site, you've got two separate activities and you've got to think about each one and how you're going to influence that sow herd with the insertion of the gilts. What if you have 60% re turnover rate a year, 60% new gilts into that sow herd versus somebody that's only got 45%? You could influence that sow herd so much more rapidly because you're inserting more gilts. For instance, to drive that point home just a little bit, uh, it's often neonatal diarrhea occurs in these young females in their first litter. Why is that? Have we not acclimatized that guilt correctly outside of the sow unit? Or maybe she's just a little bit younger. But in any case, that's how we start to look at an ARC project. Fumigation rooms, this is a real common type of fumigator that we use. We bring the equipment, the supplies into that room, close the room, turn the fumigator on, it fumigates for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever we have set it for, to deliver an aerosol disinfectant that covers the outside of all the packages or the equipment that comes into that site. So we are closing down these sites from outside traffic and making it better. Another very common aspect of how facilities have been built both in North America and what I see here in this part of the world is we have separate buildings. We don't have connecting covered hallways. We have multi-species in some of these where we have poultry and the pigs running together. Those are some hurdles that we have to get through if we want something better. And I think you will. So again, back to some of the biggest risk factors. If you have a neonatal diarrhea, are you stepping into that crate to pick those pigs up so you can treat them? And then are you moving right to the next crate? That was a great picture, Dr. Lola, that you've shown on the bottom of those boots. You know, simple things that we got to think about. Some of this ARC is just common sense. And that is everyday activity that's occurring and how is it affecting things. Feedback. Feedback is where we take material. It could be feces, it could be baby pig intestinal tracts, and we feed them back to the sow. Some major mistakes going on here. In a recent, it'll never be published, but one veterinarian in the Midwest was doing some work on his feedback programs for rotavirus and he found that 10% of the samples were infected with PERS. Again, through PCR type of diagnostics, something that we have that can sometimes uh, not be available here. Other examples, Tim talked about a very dense area. This is a part of the practice that uh, we have where there's over 50,000 pigs within a six mile radius. We know pathogens are going to move by aerosol. We approach the pigs that go into this area far differently. And yes, in that part of the practice, we're vaccinating. And we're back trying to get all the pigs vaccinated. The other thing that's happening in America is that these ARC projects, and there's 40-some, I think, 
that are now somewhat coming together. Into this one area, we have a big portion of these 50,000 pigs are coming out of Michigan in, from a project up there. So if they go positive, guess what? This part of the ARC project is going to be positive. And that's another example of what Tim talked about. What I see changing in this part of the world, is, and it's slow, is you're moving from natural ventilation to mechanical ventilation. Another excellent tool that's going to help you control what's going, what can happen inside your units as well as keeping things out. Communications. Tim talked a lot about communications, and I want to support that in a wholeheartedly. But one of the things that I see in parts of my travels in Southeast Asia is that there's still some competition. And so if you know your neighbor's status, that may be to your advantage, but you use it differently than what we're describing in ARC projects. It's a cooperative effect. And that cooperative attitude has to be a foundation if the project's going to work correctly. So the communication is not just within people, but it's also another example of communication is a software program that we use to rate our biosecurity. How do we score on internal and external biosecurity? This, pro this program is called PADRAP for short, Production Animal Disease Risk Assessment Program. And I'm just going to go through it just briefly. This is one of the reports that we get back. And it's a benchmarking for your farm versus everybody else's farm that's enrolled into the project. So we, on the left-hand side, you have scores for external. On the bottom, you have the numerical scores for the internal and how you answer these questions. This is a program where originally it was about 240 questions that we work through with every client, every site. Now, if you were a sow farm, you answered pretty much all of them. If you were a nursery site or a finishing site, then we were limited on how many. But out of that, we get divided into quadrants. You've got a low risk external, low risk internal in this quadrant, up in this quadrant, it's a high risk for both, both external and internal. And out of that, how you answer the questions is you're given a numerical score that can be benchmarked. So this is part of that communication. And let's drill down just a little bit more with a few more examples on this. This particular report, a risk profile summary, again, breaks things out into internals, risk, an external risk, and you start to see where the score came in from the way the questions were answered, and then it gives you a kind of a profile of how you rate on that particular question. Now, if you want to drill down even further, okay, you got a basic score of internal, basic score of external. Let's go down into the individual risk report. This is a little bit more complicated, but you get things like the relative risk of possible response. And it's color-coded. Red is bad, white, yellow, that's really good. And so it depends on how you answer is, is how you get a raw score involved, and then you get this kind of an answer that comes over here. So you can take your final numerical value and you can drill down to find out what areas do I need to improve on? Is it my trucking? Is my trucks always clean, disinfected, dried before I use them? What are we doing with inside the unit when it comes to needle management? Now, one of the early things in our practice when we started to vaccinate for PERS that we had to correct was needle management. It still can move pathogens. So those are just different issues that we can drill down. Another one, again, it just shows you very quickly here when you've got red all the way across, that's a very high important uh, problem. Maybe you're in a dense area, you know, because that's part of the external aspects. But again, we can drill down and find out more and more and more. And so you summarize 
the, the assessments of all this risk. And out of that, it helps develop an attitude of the success, failure, and so forth. We've got clients that don't do everything perfect. They understand the risk because we talk to them about it. And if they break with PERS, then we go back in and that's when we try to make some changes if possible. So we can go down from the external, internal, find out what's going on and continue to drill down and make those changes in management. Application, how do we take the PADRAP score, the PCR results, and start to map them? Now in this particular project in Northwest Indiana, we're working very close with a governmental group in the state of Indiana. Uh, it's called the Indiana Board of Animal Health. They have a person on board that looks at biosecurity from a statewide basis which is kind of a neat, neat way for the government to help us as veterinarians and producers. The chart on the left shows, again, the, yellow, the white and yellow is the ones with the best numerical scores, and we have, over the course of time, eliminated PERS out of a lot of these sites. We started eliminating PERS in 1998 before we understood that we needed to load, close, and homogenize but we kind of took what we knew from Sudarabi's elimination and started to play, and we started to eliminate it in this particular part of my practice. Some of these sites became breeder herds, multiplier herds as we call them. We have 13,000 sows in this location now that sell pigs to, out for a certain genetic company. Well, their motivation is they want no PERS. Now, they have broke a couple of farms over the years, but when they get up in the morning, it's not trying to get 30 pigs per sow per year, it's also biosecurity. That's what's on their mind. But in this whole mix of producers are those that are commercial producers as well. They don't necessarily get up and the first thing they think about in the morning is biosecurity. So we, as part of the project, that's part of our communication to keep everybody thinking, okay, what's happening in my herd, what's happening in the community, and trying to move the whole thing forward. The other part of this graph, it's kind of it's kind of hard to get your hands around, but because of the positive herd in this site, positive herds in some of these others, it's a technique of graphing that says if you're close, if you're located close to that site, you have a higher degree of, or a higher chance of becoming positive for PERS. The farther away you are, the less the chance of becoming positive. So that's from an area spread type of standpoint. So we're taking the PADRAP scores, also the PCR results, and mapping them like this, and watching the improvement from year to year to year. We were just completing our mapping for the uh, activities of this summer. So this is 2012, and this is showing it a little different way. All the green sites are negative. We still have some vaccinated sites. We have a few infected sites with wild type virus. And so the other thing that's been surprising about this project, to me, but it also helps motivate me to continue to strive for something better, it's a producer-driven project. They are now saying this is their project. They're asking their neighbors to join into the project. And we still have some in the, in the geographic area that does not want to participate. But we're striving to get those involved as well. Tim is ab absolutely correct in trying to use geographic areas. This happens to be the state line between Indiana and Illinois. When we first started this project, we just selected major highways and we took it all the way up to Lake Michigan, up here in the northern part, but we haven't branched out into these two counties yet. But the producers down in this part of the project, they recruited a 10,000 sow herd over in this part of the project. You can barely see that little green arrow right there. Um, and so it's kind of neat to see how the community has continued to evolve. Now, back to you. My suggestion is, you may want to pick 
Majewski's disease is the first low-hanging fruit that you say, I want to control better. There's parts of China struggling with that pathogen right now. Others of you may say, hey, I still want to tackle PERS. And that's great. Take what we're learning in America and make it your project. That's the key. That's the take home. And we're here to help you do that. So develop that action plan to control that project. We've got just two or three slides here that's going to talk about some of the similar things that uh, Dr. Lola did. But try, if you can, use boundaries. Use some kind of a mountain range or a river or a major road or whatever it can be to set the boundaries for your geographic area. Now, those will change, possibly, but at least that's a starting point. Focus on a theme. What pathogen in that particular area do you want to control? Look at pathogen activity. That's where your testing comes in. Select those diagnostic tests that you have confidence in. And that's how you're going to build the foundation if you want to move this thing forward. The objectives of the project are pretty, pretty clear because you want to make healthier pigs. That's what's going to make you money in the long run. Characterize that area so that you know what's going on. And that's where the communications come in. But again, I'm going back to a very fundamental thing, and that is a concept. You've got to get your arms around the concept of what you're trying to do. And you may start with just a farm here and a farm there and, and figuring out what you can do with the test available to you, the other tools available to you, and then you start to move things into a geographic area. That's a possibility. What types of productions are you trying to work in? What, uh, what's the attitude of the farmers? Um, because it has to be their program. They have to move that thing forward. Tim did a great job of, of the five different steps, the five different phases. And sometimes phase one and two and three kind of blend together. You don't have to go step by step by step, but they kind of blend together as you move the project into what it may develop into. You always want to be thinking solutions because Producers are wanting disease control. So think of how you can put roadblocks in place to control pathogens. And we tried to outline that pretty well on external and internal. Your objective, keep that in front of the, of the ARC project as you implement some of the solutions, some of the controls. Vaccination is just part of it. But our pathogens today are co-infections. And that's what's making it so difficult. It may look like neonatal diarrhea. It may look like PED, but is it? Not always, from what I've seen. And then you've got different tools. Mass vaccination is a wonderful tool. And now one of the things that I'd like to leave you with, when you mass vaccinate, you're not only vaccinating that sow population, but as we've learned today, vaccines reduce shedding. You're doing some things with vertical transmission from sow to offspring that I don't think we fully appreciate yet in this industry. Measure, monitor for success. Have the attitude that you can beat it, and you will beat it. It will take time, but it can be done. We've seen it. We don't know everything yet. Gosh, we got frustrated listening to the scientists this morning because they're manipulating this virus to give us a new tool, and it's hard sometimes to diagnose it on a farm. All coffin pigs are not just mycoplasma. They're not just PERS. You can have influenza. So the co-infections is really what we're after, but take each, each pathogen, you build that database over time, you learn how to make it better. Now, are you ready to utilize those tests that we've talked about and understand them? I've had many exciting events that have occurred on my trips over here, and I think this is just the starting point of another one that's going gonna, gonna to be really neat. With that, I want to thank you for this opportunity.
Thanks a lot, Dr. Gillespie. We have a good time for questions. So if anybody has a question, please go ahead. I have a question for you, Dr. Gillespie. During your presentation, um, you mentioned that uh, ARC is not for everyone. Could you elaborate on that statement? Yeah, I'd like to. Um, the question again is, is an ARC concept, is an ARC project for everyone? No, it's not. It may not be in your particular area. You may be that island surrounded by whatever is in there on a very dense area, and there's no way that you're going to be able to control pathogens. This conversation with this breeder that I was sharing with you, he's in the process of building a boar stud, a 300, sal or a 300 boar stud that's going to be air, air filtered. Very innovative for this part of the world, and I commended him for it. He's also wanting to build a sow unit out away from his positive PERS units. Because it's part of what your question that you've asked, Jose, he, he realizes that he has two separate clientele. He, the one side, they're going to want PERS positive gilts. The other side, they're going to want PERS negative gilts. And what's going to move these ARC projects forward is the same thing that moved our attitude in North America towards where we are today is the fact that we don't want to tolerate PERS. And so we demanded out of the genetic companies back in the late 90s, early 2000s, we wanted negative gilts. First we started with the boar studs, and then we had to clean up the, the multiplier herds, the breeding herds. Well, that gave me the opportunity to learn how to eliminate by sight. Now we're looking at, in this particular ARC project, we are eliminating PERS, but it's still site by site, but it's got a whole community approach this time. That was kind of a roundabout answer, but yes. Great, thank you. Do we have any question from the audience? Okay. Um, I tried to summarize these two presentations. Um, yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, give a hand to Dr. Gillespie.